Good evening, everybody. This is uh, Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another virtual event. And tonight we have Nancy Goldstone. She's going to be discussing her brand new book, In the Shadow of the Empress. Very beautiful cover design, by the way. Did it. And, um, and I'll be monitoring the comments field. So if you have questions for Nancy, don't be shy as they occur to you throughout the hour. Go ahead and type them in the comments field and Barbara will summon me back and I'll be happy to ask any questions you might have. Uh, Barbara, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much. It's not that I have magical powers, it's just that we have this routine down. It makes me feel <laughs> a little bit like Maria Teresa, Nancy. <laughs> in any case, um, I'm really delighted. Uh, Nancy and her husband, Lawrence, are really distinguished authors of many kinds of books. And um, if I remember right, didn't you guys write some books for bibliophiles? Way oh back? yes, we're very big book people used in rare books. And um, yes, we did a series on them. That's how we got into it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's where we first got acquainted. In right. any case, I wanted to talk to Nancy about this book because like Nancy, I'm really interested in Maria Teresa. Um, and I'm especially more interested on my most recent trip to Vienna. We stayed in a wonderful hotel opposite the Opera House, but it gave us a chance to really explore the Hofburg and the Albertina, which we will get to in connection with one of her daughters. I have to say, Nancy, that while I love the Albertina and I spent two or three hours there, I didn't really understand the background of it. So your book opened up a whole new window to me about oh, good. the collection. Right, so we'll we'll talk about that as well. And then we have a couple of interesting insights to offer you about Louis Says and Marie Antoinette, um, which I thought at first was gonna be the least interesting part of this book for me, because I knew a lot about them. Uh, but it turned out that Nancy has some very interesting new material or new new perspectives anyway to offer about that. So which we'll I am to... ready to talk about. <laughs> of course you are. Yay. But let's talk about first about Maria Teresa because she really is a fascinating character. What drew you to her? Who would not want to write about Maria Teresa? I've known I want to write about Maria Teresa for years, but I have learned that it, the most important thing to do is to come up through the centuries so that you really understand the century that you're in, what came before, it matters so much. And people who just kind of drop into a century, it's very hard to figure out what actually is going on. So I did a number of books. I went up from, I actually started in the 13th century. I went from the 13th to the 14th, to the 15th, to the 16th, to the 17th. And Maria Teresa, of course, is in the 18th century. And um, I had heard a story before, but boy, am I glad I waited because I really, I saw the field much better as a result of that. But what, what's so wonderful about Maria Teresa is that she was 23 years old, pregnant, untrained, when her father suddenly died and she inherited the, um, the entire Habsburg empire. She's the first woman ever to do this. And it was, it was a huge amount of territory. It was Austria, Hungary, Bohemia, which is like Czechoslovakia, Prague, Czech Republic and Prague, Prague um, parts, and she oversaw the Austrian Netherlands, which is Belgium and Flanders. She oversaw as empress, she would oversee all of Germany, and she had and she had territory in Italy. It's a huge amount of territory, many different um, subjects, kind of subjects. And no sooner does she inherit this. Um, property, then she is attacked on all sides by almost every other European power, all at the same time on the grounds that uh, a woman would be too weak to rule or to protect her subjects, and they could just waltz in there and take over her property and divvy it up amongst themselves. And boy, did she, <laughs> she rose to the occasion, and she that was that turned out to be a really bad idea for some of them and and so i i loved her because she just really stopped everything she 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 really rose to the occasion and and sometimes by sheer will held everything together and fought back and and she ended up ruling for four decades during which time she has 16 children in 20 years all while she's ruling at the same time, it was she was just terrific. I mean, then she wasn't there were things wrong with her. I'm not saying she was the perfect ruler or anything. But from my point of view, 
she was she was really held together the Habsburg Empire and and overcame everything that they tossed at her for me. And it was a war fought because just because a woman had inherited and she showed them. Well, that's really true. Of course, you know, to really understand the Holy Roman Empire, you have to go all the way back to 800 in Charlemagne and, you know, move forward. Um, and the Habsburgs, they were an interesting family. If you want to know what they look like, the Velasquez portraits in the Spanish court have a lot to say. They had this kind of, un, you know, weird job. Yeah, that after over to a while. <laughs> yeah, uh, they really did. Um, and, and that's part of what's happening in the 18th century is that the sort of splinter of the of the Habsburgs, the the Spanish Habsburgs are not the same as the Austrian Habsburgs. It's all this, yeah. Well, yeah, in, in the 18th up. century, they lose it, yeah. Well, they do, um, and so it was a big patchwork. And in fact, the the whole ro remainder of the empire didn't really come to an end until the end of the First World War, when um, France, the Emperor France, died, and there was an heir. But by then, um, the war had splintered up. Russia and you know the rest, and it was the death blow to really the Habsburgs yeah. um, and the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Napoleon but, took care of them too. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what's really interesting, I think, when you look at the selected genealogy, which goes on for pages here, um, <laughs> at the front of the book, and which is really helpful, a you get to see the range of countries that we now think of as countries involved. B, you see that. The keys to a successful reign are good luck. And the 18th century was not a good luck time for many rulers. Um, there was, you know, the French Revolution, the whole bit collapsed. Yes, sir. Um, longevity would be an essential ingredient for a really successful ruler. And unfortunately, one of the things that really struck me when I read through this, Nancy, was smallpox. I mean, we don't even think of smallpox as a particularly pernicious disease. But I can't imagine how many people, I should have counted them, children particularly, but not all children, died of smallpox as you list in your genealogy. It was awful. It was horrible. And, and the, the thing was that they did have inoculation, but it was with live smallpox. Later, they would get like cowpox and they, it would be much safer, but it, it was risky to have the inoculation, but... Um, you had to try it because it, it just ran through whole families. It was such a virulent disease. It was, it was the COVID of its, of its time and it, it just wiped people up. And it, the thing was that if it didn't, if it didn't kill you, it still, it still marked you, you know, you were just, you were disfigured by it. And, and so it ruined lives that way. It was, it was a terrible disease. Well, it really was. We also had venereal disease, which the Spanish thoughtfully brought back from when they went to um, the Americas, because it was a disease endemic to North and South America, not to Europe. So that comes into play um, as well. But you know, if you if you look back, um, Elizabeth I barely survived smallpox and was disfigured thereafter. It was one reason she wore that heavy white maquillage makeup was to cover up her smalls smallpox scars. And Louis the 15th of France, Louis Cannes, died of smallpox and he was horribly, was, horribly. <laughs> yeah, it was really, really ugly. There's a, there's a wonderful program called Nicolas Le Floche, which is a 10 episode thing that you can watch on MHC TV. And it takes place during the reign of Louis Cannes and then on to Louis Says, which we can talk about. And um, the deathbed scene of Louis the 15th is really horrific, you know, because of the of the smallpox. But my point is that while there's a great many infants that Nancy shows died of the disease, and therefore these women who had multiple children didn't get to raise a lot of them, um, it also, you know, it attacked adults as well. It wasn't just infanticide that, um, you know, that yes. prevailed. So it was hard to rule for a long time. The other key, of course, to being a successful dynasty is fertility. I mean, you have to have luck and you have to have, you know, a certain amount of longevity. But the first duty of anyone in a dynasty who is ruling is to produce the next heir, which oftentimes led to further disaster uh, because, you know, remember the lion in winter? Um, when they, when <laughs> yes, if people reign on... too long, if they reign too long, then the people next in line got impatient. Um, but sadly for Maria Theresa, although she didn't live to see it, two of her most able children, Joseph and then Leopold, uh, died younger than they might have. 
So right. it impacted life for the daughters that you talk about, which are um, were in the Netherlands or the Habsburg Netherlands. Right. And then Maria Christina, known as Charlotte, I think, who was reigning in Naples. And you're absolutely right. When I read this, Ferdinand, her husband, was like the worst husband ever. <laughs> How she had that many children with that ghastly man. I know. Well, she was she was a trooper. I have to say, she's my she's the one. She's my and Marie Antoinette gets all the airway. You know, Marie Antoinette just takes all the oxygen out of the room. I didn't. I am embarrassed to admit that. Although on some level, of course, I knew that Marie Antoinette came from a large family. That she was Maria, um, Maria Theresa's daughter. I never even thought about her sisters. You know, it did never even occurred to me that she had sisters, really. And then he, she has these two, uh, especially that she had. They were there. Were, there were seven sisters altogether that more or less survived um, into adulthood. And but and I chose. I'm interested in women in power, so I chose to to follow. You could to follow the women who were um, most actually governed. Actually, it had something to do with with the way. Um, the politics worked out. So I, I chose one of her, her elder sisters, which was Maria Christina, Mimi, um, she's with the Albertina Museum. And um, she was, she governed Hungary first, and then the Austrian Netherlands. And, but her young, the, the sister Maria Carolina, Charlotte, who was closest in age to Marie Antoinette and closest loved Marie Antoinette, she goes down to Naples and marries, and she, Marie Antoinette, when at 14 and married Louis the 16th, Maria Carolina goes at 15 and where Marie Antoinette doesn't, the marriage isn't consummated for, you know, God, seven years or whatever. Poor Maria Carolina, she goes down, Charlotte, she goes down, she's got to consummate it that night. She's 15 and I, you know, you're raised in Maria Teresa's household. You might as well have been raised in a nunnery. So she's no experience of the world, knows nothing about men and she's got to go. And she's thrown into it. She she marries this guy. He's he's just infantile, really. He's And he's just, he couldn't care less about ruling. He's it really, in some ways, it wasn't his fault because his father and mother had um, were, went to Spain and became king and queen of Spain and left him to be king of Naples with just an, a, like a minister. And the minister did not want him to grow up and challenge him in any way. So he just kept him entertained and kept him, um, kept him young and didn't educate him so that he would never be a threat. And he just, he's horrible. <laughs> and she, but she, boy, her mother sends her down with the, the best thing about Maria Teresa was she sends them down with, they, she sends all her daughters with these letters telling them how they should live their lives and how they should do, live their, you know, what they should do with their husbands. And she says, follow your husband around anywhere. I don't care how boring it is, get him used to. And so Maria Carolina, that's what she did. And eventually she, um, um, she just grows into the becoming queen and she takes over the government because he he won't do it. He has no interest whatsoever. And so, and, you know, he cheats on her all the time. He gives her venereal disease. He's he he's just uh, a jerk. What can I tell you? <laughs> yeah, and sadly, he outlives her, which is really too bad. You'd like to think that he would have died first and given her a little freedom, but didn't work out that way. No. It's hard to believe that anybody who grew up with a mother who had 16 pregnancies or even more um, was so, you know, kind of innocent of the whole process. I mean, Victoria no. had nine children, and I don't know whether, you know, it was kind of the same routine, but Maria Teresa was pregnant for, as you point out, for 20 years. So how did her kids not sort of- No, no, they knew what they were supposed to do, but there's a big difference between knowing intellectually what yeah. you are supposed to do and never having even kissed a guy before or never oh, held hands with a guy before, never had a guy take his, you know, never had to take your clothes off in front of someone. Nothing, none of that happened. You know, their lives were very regulated and it's a, it's a, I think, especially at 15, if you are not ready for it, and she clearly was not ready for it because she wrote these letters that said, you know, in the beginning, I just wanted to die, basically. That's how they talk, teenagers. They're sometimes when they, they but she, you know, she really did not like it and, and wasn't ready for it. And I have a lot of sympathy for that because she overcame, eventually she overcame all that and just 
and 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 ended up living, you know, and and then it ended up really doing a terrific job as queen in Naples. So marrying for love was not really an option for most of these people, but Maria Theresa was really fortunate in that she fell in love with her husband and the daughter, Mimi, the one that is um, who goes to Hungary and then to the Netherlands, was also married for love, which her two sisters, uh, Maria Carolina and Marie Antoinette, obviously did not. So if we go all the way back to Maria Theresa's father, my comment about fertility, Charles didn't have sons. And so there was Maria. Um, and he went through a lot of manipulation to perhaps even prevent her marrying her much loved husband. What was that all about? Well, he, um, so Maria Theresa's father is emperor and he is, has this just terrible problem that he only sires two girls and no, and you know, what a terrible thing it would be to have a girl instead of a boy run something. So he's got to try and, and she's got to inherit his property, but he's afraid that if she does exactly what happened would happen, what happened would happen that people would attack her and he was trying to protect her. So first he figures um, he should marry her to somebody strong like the King of Spain or King of Spain's son or something like that. But those things fall through and, and his one of his advisors had early said to him, well, he, she should marry um, this guy Francis of Lorraine because Lorraine is very crucial part of the empire. It's right on the border with France and we need them to be strong against France because France was uh, at the time, France and Austria were, um, the, were the biggest enemies to each other. And so they were trying to keep, keep Germany, keep France from invading Germany and invading Lorraine or in coming through to Austria because that's what Louis XIV had done. And Louis XIV had, been, had always been trying to push out towards Germany, get, take over um, French, ter you know, expand French territory. So, so they got this nice guy, Francis of Lorraine. Um, he's only like 14 when he comes. He comes for like a trial run when Maria, Teresa is six and he's 14. And, you know, as to a six year old, a 14 year old is just like a god. <laughs> She's, she, and he was an adorable. Francis is totally adorable. He's, he loves to hunt. He loves, to, he's very good with people. He's very social. As, as she grows up over time, he, you know, she just only falls more and more in love with him. But her father has to keep trying, he keeps trying to give away her territory and he's trying to bribe people to say that he that they will accept her as a ruler later or the other powers who might attack her. So it's just a terrible strategy. He spends all of their money, all of the kingdoms, the empire's money. He spends, you know, the, he ruins the army. There's one war after another. And um, in the, the last war, he lost so badly that he had to give up Lorraine. And he makes um, uh, her Maria Theresa's uh, fiance, Francis of Lorraine, sign it away. And that is a really hard thing to do because Francis of Lorraine was, um, he, he was counting, he, he, that was his family's possession. It, there was his family subjects, his mother's still living there, his sisters are still living there. And he had to give it all, all away in order to marry Maria Theresa. And this was very, very hard for, for him and for Maria Theresa. And she spent the rest of her life actually trying to make that up to him, trying to, to give him other territory and, and trying to make him res respected so that um, it was because it was such a knife in the heart to him to do that. Well, it was, and that comes back to my point about sometimes people live too long. I mean, if Charles had just died sooner, um, <laughs> well, I'm serious. he wasn't that. <laughs> Um, well, you know, at the end, at the very end, when, um, you know, Franz Joseph, I mean, he lived way too long. He was the wrong king, you know, to be, or the but, wrong but emperor. But that's the thing about inherited monarchy. That's you right. can get a, you get a lot of bad ones and there's no way to uh, remove them legitimately right. or honorably. They, people didn't step aside back then. That was dishonorable. The only way to do it is to rise up and, and get rid of them. And um, that unfortunately happens often in the 18th century. Well, it does. I mean, disease also can, or accident can make a big difference. I mean, you know, if you look at British history, 
you know, if Arthur hadn't died to Ludlow Castle, we wouldn't have had Henry VIII, which would have been a real blessing. Um, <laughs> if, if young Henry hadn't died, you know, on the Thames or whatever it was, we wouldn't have gotten Charles I. That would have been a really good idea. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are so many things that can go wrong with an inherited monarchy. And it can lead to, you know, like the English Wars of the Roses, it can lead to all kinds of bitter wars. And, you know, we're in an age where autocrats are kind of making a comeback, but unless they're dynastic, there's always a mess when they die. I mean, when Stalin died, who was gonna take over? You know, when Erdogan goes, which can't be too soon, um, you know, what's gonna happen in Turkey? And, you know, the problem with autocracy is that there's no really great mechanism to keep the government going. And, even though recent events in the United States have shown that democracy can really fail at this as well. And I hope that we're gonna see our way through. When you did have a monarchy, you were really dependent upon, as I said, the good luck, the longevity and the fertility of the uh, members of the, of the dynasty. And when it went wrong or when they quarreled or whatever, um, it was terrible on the populace. And then of course you wound up with ministers, with courtiers who um, tried to, you know, move the levers of government, right? Because it's, yes, they it's would really try to take thing. over. And I, I really liked what you wrote about uh, Sir William Hamilton and Emma Hamilton. And you know, she's a person that I, I thought I knew a lot about, but you went into her in even more depth. That's a truly remarkable story. What happened to Emma? Yes, Emma Hamilton, Lady Emma Hamilton. She's um. <laughs> I don't know why, how is there not a miniseries on her already, right? Oh, there because she is. I mean, she ends up as the, you know, mistress of Lord Nelson, but on the way she, you know, from a six-year-old orphan in terrible straits through working on the streets and, you know, working in a brothel and eventually becoming a mistress and then being handed off to the, to her, lovers. Unbelievable uncle. story. Beautiful, beautiful girl. One of the most um, she was so pretty that people actually stopped in the street and, and right. looked at her. Well, you can look at the portraits that Romney painted of her, you know, and yes. I mean, you have one in the, in the book and she really was absolutely gorgeous. But you know what, if you've got an emptiness behind a pretty face, that's right. It only goes so far. So it clearly, um, she had a really powerful personality in addition, but she must've had incredible survivor instincts. Well, you could see it. I mean, she really, she came from nothing. She has no money. She has to go out on the streets when she's very young. And she, and, and she has a series of, she, she goes, she does have to go into a brothel. She gets a piece of luck in that a guy buys her out of the brothel. Then he gets her pregnant and leaves her. And she has to go to somebody else. And that, that person um, agrees to take it, take her in. And she falls in love with this, with this other guy. And he does just as the most, most heinous thing and kind of trades her to his old uncle and without telling her. And she ends up in Naples with, uh, I love that. And also she always has her mother with her as her servant. I love that. Yeah, well, <laughs> but, and she ends up much. helping to save Maria Carolina and Naples because um, they were the ones who were absolutely, Lord Nelson would not have been able, Admiral Nelson would not have been able to um, attack Napoleon in Egypt, if they had not gotten him, gotten him all the supplies that they, he needed at the right time, so he could just take off after them, and that was a big battle that that they won, and that was completely because those two women, Charlotte and Emma Hamilton, um, arranged it. It was, Marie it really was something died in the 1760s. What was it? 1765. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, she her daughters obviously move on uh, towards the end of the century through the French Revolution and Napoleon. It was, you know, um, a real threat to them. Um, but it was Maria Theresa's job as a ruler to arrange dynastic marriages for her daughters or for the children that she could manage to make successful marriages for. So you, you started out liking Maria Theresa, but then you really became interested in these three daughters and their <laughs> marriages. And and what well, happened? you know, the thing about Marie Teresa, and I, I really feel that, you know, I think the job really got to her. I mean, she became a different person than she was in the beginning towards the end, because 
it was just she that woman she read every paper she shared her own council meeting she took everything to heart she she really really tried and it's a huge job and what after her husband died um she like all the fire went out of her and and as she got older her eldest son who was going to take over joseph just got them into one problem after another and she just couldn't say no to him because mm -hmm. she didn't want to emasculate him and, and and he he had turned against her because he he had his own bitter life kind of going on and and she and she couldn't bear it so she kind of let him and this other advisor do what they wanted to do and so she didn't become she she became someone who who was much more um I know she would never have, she agreed to things that she would never have agreed to do when she was younger, um, just because it was, she was overburdened. But the daughters, they stayed <laughs> right to the end. They fought all the way uh, through. They didn't, they didn't have something like that happen to them. So uh, yes, I, and, and the daughter's lives were so, Maria Christina has an affair with her sister-in-law, but you know, this is, this, this was um, something that you don't usually see in in when when I've been investigating royalty, where there's such an obvious um, connection between two women, and that they are clearly um, in love with each other, and I thought that was that was um, pretty pretty exciting, pretty wonderful that they that they had that things that we see today happen. You can you can see happen then too. Well, yeah. oh, there were some instances of kings who were known to be gay. Um, Roderick Richard the Great II. was gay. Yeah, and Richard, what was it, Richard the Second, Richard the First of England, I can't remember which, um, was rumored to be gay. Richard the Second was rumored there's, to be gay. There's much you know, more there, in the French Edward court. Richard the Second is the one I'm thinking of. But anyway, um, you're right, it was far less, but maybe it was less obvious with women. I'm, you know, it yes, it, that's that. what I'm saying. It was, you know, you don't. You, it was hard to document that kind of thing. And well, um, yeah, and I don't think that people, you know, women are are not as actively, you know, as visible actively right. um, as men are when it comes to that kind of thing. Let's talk about your interesting research into Louis the Sixteenth because you know you really raise, I thought, a fascinating point in that. Um, Generally, when there has been a revolution, the reigning monarch has made a serious effort to protect his family and his children. After all, the children are the legacy um, that needs to be most, um, that he's entrusted with and needs to be the most proactive to keep safe. And Louis the Sixteenth didn't do any of that. I mean, you often wonder, well, what was it, you know, that Marie Antoinette and the children didn't make it out of France? It really shouldn't have been that hard. But it was like they just denied reality. So, what's your theory there? Well, um, I think I was I went through and um, I wasn't when I was writing this book. I did not expect to have anything new to say about Marie Antoinette. I wanted to put Marie Antoinette in there because I want to get the you know she's so big and right. and um, the French Revolution. But the second I started to really look into it, it, I will say there was something about that story that always bothered me was that they never got out because right. um, every single book I write. They have somebody has to leave, and they always get to try and get the kids, women, even Charles the first, who ended up getting his, you know, getting his head cut off, was um, he got his wife and four of his children out. So this is was was something that used to be, was was supposed to happen, but as soon as I started to investigate um, Louis the Sixteenth life, I saw that he was very almost certainly autistic I had uh, autism was born with autism spectrum disorder this is this is clearly documented that this was a per, that from from childhood he didn't look people in the eye he had um he didn't speak he had a lot of trouble carrying on even uh, any kind of a conversation he didn't play with the other children instead he ran up on the roof and chased cats later he shot cats on the roof he had physical manner with me. He had with trouble. He was uh, he was described as very clumsy and had th these made these funny faces. He had to keep to a rigorous schedule. And when I looked at all of this, I I actually um, went to someone who had been who was a specialist in this. Obviously, I'm not. 
And I just described all these symptoms to this doctor who has worked for 20 or 30 years at uh, Yale. And I said, what do you think of this? And she, and she wrote back and she, she said, he checks every box for autism spectrum disorder. And, uh, and if the thing that is, the reason that no one has seen this before is, um, first of all, this is an, a lot, most people don't look at Louis the 16th's life and the people who are usually in Europe and they don't have as much of a feel for this uh, particular disorder as we have here. And also Louis the 16th, one of his ministers figured out right away that what you do is you write everything down and you communicate to him through writing. And he's, Louis the 16th was very intelligent and you can see from all the written material how intelligent he was, but he couldn't uh, confront, he couldn't communicate really. He, he, he was, he just, you had to always, you couldn't just look at the written reports. You had to look at the observations, what, what other people said about him. And, and I have, was lucky because the, um, when Marie Antoinette was sent to live with um, at the court, it was Louis the 15th was still king then. Um, her, mother, her mother was doing some long distance parenting at that point. And she sent her with kind of a spy and somebody who was gonna report, an ambassador who was gonna report on her every move. And he also reports on Louis's every move. And you can just see all the way through that this was, this was a situation where that nobody really understood the Dauphins, understood his behavior, and but this was the behavior and it persists all through life. And I've seen this with in the in the 15th century, uh, for example, in France, you it's very, it seems like, oh, you can't diagnose from so far in the future, right? We can we would love to bring Louis the 16th forward and put him in a in an office, in a doctor's office, and 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 go through all the tests that we would do today, but we can't do that. But you can actually figure this stuff out because in the 15th century, the King of France, Charles VI, he had these symptoms where every couple of months he would not know who he was. He would think he was somebody named George. They'd have to lock him up in the castle. He'd take off all his clothes and run around screaming and, and he didn't know anyone. And now we say that, um, that Charles VI was schizophrenic. And interestingly, there was, because Charles VI was schizophrenic and there was kind of a vacuum at the power at the top of the, of the monarchy, that's when there was a civil war also in France. So the fact that Louis isn't, it, 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 Louis is there, but he is, he is much more um, listen, uh, not able to, if you can't read people's behavior and you can't look at them in the eye and you don't know what's coming, you are at a great disadvantage. And he couldn't speak at a time when France, every great order in the, <laughs> in the world is, is, in, is in France talking about democracy and, and, or the revolution. So he was at a distinct disadvantage. Well, another giveaway was that his apparent complete fascination with clocks, um, yes. you know, that he was very numbers oriented and so forth. So I think your your diagnosis, I mean, it seems quite obvious you think about it. And, you know, on, on the other hand, you know, if mental illness was not often or not mental illness, but but differences, you know, different, things different. Like that. think about poor George III, who was thought to be mad and who actually had porphyria for which there was no no treatment or no cure. Right. Um, so, you know, without modern medicine, we are indeed having to guess. Um, but I agree with you that, you know, you can do a observational thing. Um, so you go on to posit that um, Marie Antoinette, who ended up having two sons, one of whom died young, and what, two daughters, was that it? Right, well, that one of them died her, young. Her children, either four or three of them anyway, were fathered not by, by Louis, who barely understood the mechanics of sex and probably didn't want to do it anyway, but by the Swedish count, Axel Fursen, who was, um, there's a lot of evidence that you know he and the queen were, were intimate. Um, so do you feel fairly confident that he was the father of the boy who was perceived to be the Dauphin and died I'm during the revolution? I'm so glad you asked me that question. We had a lot of pushback on this one because I want to I want to explain that you know when we do history, history isn't a court of law. There's no presumption of innocence. What we do is we list the evidence, we weigh the evidence, and we come out with on the side of there's where there's the most evidence, 
If, there, if the evidence is equal, then you say we can't tell. And if it's a little bit one way, then you say, well, it's, it's, it's possible that it went this way. But when the evidence is like up here and down here, we, we have to go where the evidence shows us. And what we had here was a situation where um, Count Axelferson um, is very clearly attracted to Marie Antoinette. We have reports even from the Swedish ambassador who says, I'm so, who says these two can hardly basically keep their hands off each other. And it's a good thing that Axel first and has to, he just, he goes and fights in the American revolution of all things. So he gets him out of town. He says, what a relief that is. I think, you, you know, we got away with that, but he comes back in um, 1783. And from then on, there are, there are records of clandestine meetings. They have this elaborate correspondence, Marie Antoinette and, uh, Count Furson, where they have code names for each other. They're, they're surreptitious. They're going through a, um, a trusted confidant for this who has been sworn to secrecy. Furson goes so far as to number his letters in case one of them goes astray so that she doesn't, um, so that she'll know if something's missing. We have his diary, which is just filled with how much he loves her and all this times that in code kind of that he went and visited her. But even more than that, we have the head of the Royal Guard, of Louis' Royal Guard, who is reporting that this guy is staying over for days at a time at Petit Trianon, and um, that she has her ladies in waiting there, but they, she never sees them. She has them kind of for cover, but they never see her during this period. It's three or four times a week they're meeting sometimes. And then there's this after, because Louis, she, they did have a lot of trouble having children, Louis and Marie Antoinette. And he's, um, he, 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 that was because he did not understand how conception worked, how the sex act worked. And her, her brother-in-law had, her brother had to come, came and explained to him very, quietly and, and rationally how it was done. And then they worked on it and, and they attributed their first child to their first pregnancy to her brother for doing this. And they named the second child which, who was born the boy while Furson was away. So he was his Louis son to, they named him Louis Joseph. So you, that was Marie Antoinette's brother's name who did this. So you can see that those two children whose births were, spread out over a period of time, um, those were Louis's children. The second person comes, she gets pregnant the next month. And that now that one ends in, um, in um, miscarriage. But then she had, gives a big party for the friend, for the Swedish ambassador, where for, where, for the Swedish king, where Furson is present and nine months of the day after that one, she has her son. And then the next period of time, um, she has a daughter, which she also clearly thinks that he and she and Furson think are is Furson's. And during this time, in addition to all of that, um, Louis is not um, the Count de Mercy said uh, the the uh, Austrian ambassador said it was highly unlikely that Marie Antoinette and Louis would have any more children because their schedules are so different. What's really happening is that the situation is deteriorating, and Louis, because of his disorder, is is you know, is becoming more and more stress on him. And this is very hard for him. So he spends all his time hunting. And when he comes home from hunting, as much as time as he can, he just eats and drinks himself basically into a coma and they have to lug him to bed. And, and, they, and, and his servants just put him to bed every night. That is not a person who is going to be having sex. And Marie Antoinette is, is hardly ever even there. So you can see that the weight of the evidence is, is such that it would be the only thing on the side that it is that these last two children were fathered by Louis the Sixteenth is that the, those two were married. That's the only thing, and they are not having, um, and they never had sex more than seems more than once a week as it was because Louis had to be on a schedule. You wouldn't just have sex with Louis. You would have to like. Um, get get him prepared for it. He would have to know when it was coming. That kind of thing. So. I think the evidence is overwhelming that those two children, the, the younger children, the, da the daughter died, but the son that died, that was the Dauphin and is called Louis the 17th today, that he, that was Furson's child. Furson certainly considered it, I think they both considered him to be his.
Oh, and I'm sorry, getting so much. I can't believe that people don't. What's wrong with this? You know, what's wrong with letting her have an have a love? I mean, this is this. It's not like she was sleeping with everybody. This is one guy who she is completely in love with and is having a real marriage with. Basically, that he's much more her husband than Louis the Sixteenth. Well, I'm you know I I love the irony because Louis the Fourteenth is well known to have needed sex at least three times a day. Yeah. Um, you know, so what a contrast. But what's really going on here in part, though, is that, you know, for a wife to be unfaithful was treason because, you know, the, the deal was that the children of the of the of the wife, in other words, a legitimate marriage, were going to be the heirs. So right. the king could have illegitimate children all over the place. See, I, I think Charles II, for example, made a terrible error when he did not divorce his sterile wife. I mean, he had bastards all over I, him. <laughs> and, you know, and he but left, that guy he ended left, without a death. <laughs> he left this awful mess because he, he did not divorce Catherine of Braganza, who was his um, Portuguese right. wife. And, um, and I think that he was derelict in his duty as a king, you know, not to have done that. So Marie Antoinette would have been guilty of treason if Louis had wanted to do something about it, but because he was probably relieved that she had a. No, lover. no, it wasn't. It wasn't. He wasn't relieved at all. In fact, we have a report also again from the uh, head of the royal really? guard that says Louis knew, and and that, but that he couldn't, and that he was upset. Yeah. But that he could not. Um, that she got around the well the. What the uh, head of the royal guard says is Marie Antoinette got around him, but you know what actually happened was that Louis cannot confront Louis. Louis would and oh. Louis could not lose her because she was his emotional. She was really his only emotional outlet. She he needed her. She was she was his uh, the way that he approached the world was through her. It's when everything started to collapse, she had to take over. She would she would have all the meetings. Then she would go to Louis very quietly and calmly and try and find a way to, to, to um, come up with a policy. But he he she he he needed her. This was love to him. And um, so he was never going to confront her. And that's why. And that's another reason why people said, well, it, it, it was if she was so obvious, then. Um, how come he didn't just punish her? Louis was incapable of punishing her. And I will say that she saved him. I mean, she, she didn't save him, but she, she repaid him by staying. She, you know, she stayed and did her absolute best to protect him. When she stayed in, in when, when every other um, aristocrat left uh, it, it, and when the, when the Bastille fell, and it was, and they decided who was going to go with the army and who was going to leave. And she stayed, she was staying and his sister was staying, they were staying to protect him. It wasn't the other way around. Usually the king protects the wife and, and kids. They were staying to protect him. And you can see this, you can see this when the mob attacks the Tuileries and they are in the, um, the, it was a mob attack, it was just like January 6th, right? 30,000 enraged Parisians with with weapons and axes and pikes break down and, and rush into the Tuileries. And there's only 200 Royal Guard. It's like the Capitol Police, right? They're totally overwhelmed. So what they do is they decide they're gonna separate the king and queen and everyone's after Marie Antoinette as much as, as, as Louis. They're gonna separate them and try and protect them that way. And Marie Antoinette wants to go with the king. And they say, no, no, you have to go with the children. So the, his sister goes with the king. His sister is 25 years old and has led a completely sheltered life. And she lets her go with, go with him to go and confront this mob. Now, can I, can I say maybe in, the, in Louis is in his 35 or 36 at this point, he's been king since he was 20 he, or 19. He's got family he has, he's had kids he's been doing this would this be would you take your sister into that would you take your 25 year is that who you really want to confront a mob of screaming men with with um with weapons do you want to put her in that situation wouldn't you really would wouldn't you say you know what honey stick why don't you sit this one out go find a nice quiet room in the closet and go sit in there they're not looking for you but no, she has to go with him. He needs these women as his support. 
as his emotional support. That's part, and it's not his fault. It's, you know, this is what the disorder is. You, you, you need someone with you. Um, it, it, it's just, it was just the saddest thing. It's a sad, sad situation. Oh, he really wrong. wanted to be a good king. He yeah. would have, he would, they were in the process of trying to tax the nobility when, when um, the best deal fell. He just couldn't get it through. He didn't have those skills. That was it. it that was, was the, the wrong whole... king for the wrong moment. You know, just like Nicholas II was the wrong Tsar of Russia and Charles I was the wrong king of England. Um, it's really hard to confront these, you know, angry mobs and forces of change. I mean, we're seeing the terrible shape we are here in the United States where, you know, we almost had a coup and we're, you know, this big lie continues. And um, unfortunately, so far anyway, we've held the line, but it's embarrassing to live here in Arizona where this audit, you know, has just been a nightmare. Um, and so imagine that if what you've got is, you know, larger armed insurrections and kind of no real backup um, to, to protect people. But you have to say that um, Maria Teresa's three daughters that you write about really were their mother's daughters, really lived up to their mom, because their lives all fell apart. You know, Marie Antoinette's we've talked about fell apart. The older sister, um, the um, Austrian Netherlands, that eventually fell apart. Is the, and they were brought back to live in Vienna, kind of pension, pensioned off, um, which is where the Albertina, the museum in Vienna, um, the art treasures, because that, that daughter was an artist. And, um, and her husband indulged her in that. And they had a wonderful collection. But I, I thought it was sad. And I, I'm thinking back, Nancy, to how I went through the Albertina. You're saying that she doesn't really have much credit in it, that the Tina is her. But, you know, it's more about, about Albert and thinking back, because I didn't know any of this if, before I went there. I wish I had, because I think I would have paid a lot more attention to the attributions um, you know, of, of the art. And it isn't just art. I mean, it's wonderful. It's furniture. It's, you know, beautiful rooms, all kinds of treasures and so forth. Right. Um, and, you know, if it's her legacy, it's a shame that that isn't more obvious. That if, if without her, um, well, first of all, Albert was never going to ever collect anything because he had no money. Her, right. she, she had all the money. And um, in fact, she was the one who got them started on this. He, he, that's how they how they connected was through art. Um, and, and she taught him about art and they went and traveled together and they decided to do this, this kind of collection together. But what really happened was um, when the French Revolution spread out, I think Americans don't realize this, but it went from, from France all the way into Belgium, it went into Germany, it went, it went everywhere. Of, because of Napoleon and, and if she hadn't um, packed up all their stuff, all their art uh, and brought it with her when, when she had to leave and when she had to flee before the revolution, the revolutionaries, then um, that all that stuff would have been in France in the Louvre somewhere in crates because they, they, that's what Napoleon would have picked it up and just put it there and taken oh, yeah, it. Yeah, it would have been like the Russians who you know got to Germany um, you know, and took the whole movie, The Monument Men, is is about that. And there's a lot of stuff in um, St. Petersburg and the Hermitage that, you know, was was confiscated by the Russians when they moved. Patton was going this way, the Russians were coming this way and so forth. And actually, turns out that there was a lot of pillaging by the United States as well. So <laughs> we just don't know as much about it. But I'm sure you're right that she um, that she preserved it. And, you know, she was lucky in that she really loved Albert and, um, you know, had a, had a happy marriage and survived, um, you know, they survived the revolution, but, and relocated to Vienna where they were, you know, had an allowance or whatever it was, her money right. and survived. Her sister, the, the queen of Naples had a much tougher time. Um, and, you she know, had to fight Napoleon. Yeah, that we was, don't really think of of Sicily, you know, as a as a kingdom. I mean, we think of it today as just part of Italy, but but it wasn't. Um, all the way back to the Crusaders, you know, um, it was strategically important because uh, there was in the middle of the Mediterranean, and 
um, you know, and it, it was a powerful kingdom. And in the end, Napoleon sort of broke up her life, but it was really the British who dealt the coup de grace. Yes, it's true because then that's because the Mediterranean was so important, and Britain was Britain's interests were so much against the French there, against Napoleon. They they turned on her just as she had been in alliance with them, um, Maria Carolina, and just like her mother had been once been in an alliance with England with Britain, and Britain pursued its own interests and broke those alliances and both and betrayed both of them both the mother and the daughter which was was pretty uh interesting as a parallel in history but i have to say that if because she um maria carolina the kingdom of naples was the entire southern boot of italy everything south of rome plus the island of sicily so when napoleon first came when his armies first came they went just to um Naples. And so she had to flee to Sicily. I have to say, if you have to flee somewhere, Sicily is not a bad, <laughs> bad place. True. <laughs> Very true. No, it, it was Naples. And, um, you know, there's a lot, there's a, I keep coming back to series on MHC TV because I watch a lot, but there's a, a wonderful series called The Bastards of Pizza Falcone mm -hmm. by the late, I'm trying to remember his name, Maurizio somebody. But anyway, um, in filming it, it's, it's, it really shows you all this magnificence of Naples, all the buildings that have survived and so forth. And it's wonderful to watch. Pisa Falcone is a police district in Naples, which is why it's called that. And if you go to Sicily, it has an enormous number of Greek ruins because it was Greek before it was Roman. Everybody and, um, wanted Sicily. It was and right even, in the way. You know, even in people who, who, who are living in kind of poverty and so forth, when you watch this stuff, it's amazing how big their apartments and so forth are. You know, <laughs> I mean, if you if you watch British crime, you see people living in these ghastly little, you know, cells in, in high-rise public housing. And then you go to Naples and you have people roughly in the same income level, but they're living in, you know, these gorgeous Naples rooms. was Miami Beach. Naples was a was a party town when when Maria Carolina lived there. I mean, yeah, it, it, was. it was on the Grand Tour and every they had lots of lots of visitors all the time and, and and they had ice cream when nobody else had it i mean it was a great place to be everyone loved naples well it, it had a really good climate compared to yeah. let's say england um but the british were ruthless about you know because um their empire depended upon their control of the ocean that's um, right all the seas and so they were pretty ruthless about gibraltar and about you know sicily and naples and about malta and certainly Egypt um, and, you know, onward through India, Hong Kong, all the rest of it. Um, so they were not a sentimental nation. And um, they, Sir William Hamilton and Lady Emma, who we referenced earlier, um, were very close to Marina, Maria Carolina. Yes, but, they were. Um, but, you know, Sir William was elderly. And um, eventually when Napoleon was dislodged, Napoleon actually put one of his brothers right and his brother's wives on he, the put, he put it first his brother and and then what napoleon had a problem because napoleon was um conquering so many kingdoms he had to like keep moving his family around because you know he, he so he he took over naples and put his brother there and then he took over spain so he took his brother from that and put his sister there with his brother-in-law uh, instead and um but i what i really love about and, and then and there was complete war he recognized maria Car napoleon recognized maria carolina as the person who was who was his antagonist in in italy of of everyone he knew that she was the one who was going to fight him the most and and so they were they hated each other for a long time and then napoleon decided that he did, couldn't get a son out of uh, josephine and so or out of his out of his first wife so he divorced her and he married he married um daughter of the of the emperor of austria and um that was <laughs> that was maria carolina's granddaughter so she said ah oh, now i have to be i have to be the devil's grandmother you know <laughs> on top of everything else and he started calling her my dear grandma you know <laughs> well napoleon was just as dynastic as the habsburgs you know and, and just um, a social climbing don't don't kid yourself i mean, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean he was trying very hard to you know sort of like the mafia 
you know, he was trying to put, um, or the, you know, the Sopranos. I mean, he was trying to put members of his family in control of everything that he conquered. Um, right. And of course, he got greedy, and then he got really stupid and tried to add Russia to the whole thing, but we won't go there. Overconfident. Um, Right. He was never right. stupid, but he might have been overconfident. <laughs> he was a very smart. He was. He was. He and Frederick the Great did the 18th and then and then the the 18th and into the 19th century. Those were the two great military geniuses. And well, and Napoleon yeah. based himself on Frederick the Great. All that he moving did. fast but and getting there quick. He wasn't just a military genius. He was an administrative. Yes, genius. also an administrator. Um, and you know, like like Edward the First, Edward the Lawgiver. You know, of, but of first he had to be the military genius. <laughs> Henry the Second. I mean, it takes to be a really successful monarch like Maria Theresa. You yeah. know, you really do have to understand the levers of power and how to operate them and how to how to run a bureaucracy essentially, because no one person can just govern on his own and you're right napoleon was a g he also apparently survived on four hours of sleep a night so he had all kinds of extra working hours <laughs> um you know he's a fascinating character and he really did blast so much of europe um some of which never really recovered but anyway um we we don't know as much i think in america about the Habsburgs in central europe as we know about england and france italy and so forth um, and so it's really great to to have a book that um, lets you that's, see. That's um, what I try to do. The I heart try, of Europe was Habsburg. I try to provide the context. You know, I, I don't expect anyone to know who won the War of the Austrian Succession. That's what makes it so great to write about because if you don't know how the war is going to end, there's a lot of real tension in there. Imagine if you were reading a book about World War II and you did not know if Hitler was going to win or not. Okay, that's the kind of, of tension that you can get in this kind of book. And it's also, you can live through it with the, these people. They were real people. They, were, they lived larger lives than anything I ever had. And mm -hmm. it's, it's exciting, and, and, but also you learn it. This is what really happened. You really had wars, but you really had a war because a woman, because nobody wanted a woman to inherit and they learned their lesson. And that's great. <laughs> but people who like fiction, who think that, you know, they don't want to read historical nonfiction, not true because you couldn't actually make this stuff up no. um, easily. And so really Nancy's book in the end reads like that, that one, but two novels. And I can also recommend Robert Massey's amazing biography of Catherine the Great which I thought was an absolutely riveting thriller. Um, I read it while I was traveling, in fact, through this um, territory. So there have been some remarkable women in history. Too often, all the voices in history we hear are men. Um, but every once in a while, you get somebody like... There's been plenty of women. It's just now that we are starting. It's, you know, history is, was not just written by the winners. It was written by men. And it's been written by men for ages. Now we're more women are coming in now, but this is a brand new phenomenon. When I first started out, women, you know, when I wrote my first book was about four queens, was about four 13th century sisters from Provence. Wow. Um, that was a very difficult book to get published because nobody, why would you want to read about four women? You know, it was that kind of thing. It was, but in every century I have found women, this is, this is how why there are there are so many mysteries in history because we leave all the women out. History makes a lot more sense when you put the women back in. And and that oh, is actually does. And you know, we do have some forensic tools available to us now. For example, um, you know, the whole Anastasia rumor that one of the Romanov sisters survived um the um assassination of Nicholas and his family. But you know, they eventually found bones and they took DNA from Prince Philip. Right. Um, and determined that in fact this really was the, the Romanov family. Um, and if the heart of the young Dauphin is um, you know, has a provenance sufficient, they could actually test it and prove your theory. You know, they could. Um, they they tested it against Marie Antoinette's hair and it was Marie Antoinette's. I think they know myself. I mean, they, it was never publicly tested. It might have been private. I don't know. They would have to exhume the bones, I think. I'm not sure they want to do that, to go to that expense to do that. Well, there's some, you know, some things that probably are better off left to right. rest. I mean, um, right. I, I have a novelist friend who raised the whole question of whether Victoria was actually legitimate or whether her mother, in fact, who did have a lover, um, 
whether she was, you know, not in fact um, a Hanoverian, but uh, and they know where the lover is buried and they could open the tomb and, you know, try to figure it out. But what would be the point? Um, right. At this stage that one, I, I wouldn't open it up either because you know uh, what? She was Victoria. Doesn't matter what her. Well, and at this point, no, it really does. I mean, and part of the reason that the whole thing comes up is there's no real explanation for how hemophilia, you know, how how she was a, a hemophilia, which is a genetic disease, and nobody had it in the family before. Uh, and unfortunately, she passed it on. So the right. question is, where did she get it? Um, but anyway, um, this has been fascinating. It's really been fun. Patrick, do you want to come back? And do you have any questions of your own you might want to throw in? No, but absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, are, are you struck, Nancy, when you're researching this by how little human nature really changes? <laughs> yes. and, and how contemporary these stories feel? Yes, and, and, and that's what I loved about it was that, you know, everything that we deal with, you know, we are, this is not that long ago, okay, the, the 18th century. It feels like, I know the people that, that live today, it feels like the, the ancient past, but it's not. And people don't change that much. And I think it's refreshing that we had, you know, that we had gay people and, and lesbians and um that they reacted to things the way we would react to, to, to today. And it's, just a, and it's just a question of, we have to, we have to um, be willing to write about stuff as it really is. It doesn't help to gloss over things. It doesn't help to mythologize people or, or, or not to, to look at the truth. This is, this is a period that's very crucial, the 18th century, very crucial to what we are living in now because the 18th century is gonna bleed into the 19th and then we're here at, at you know, this, we, Frederick the Great, um, who did everything he did because his father um, was so abusive to him because his father did not want it to, his son to be gay. That, what everything Frederick did, that was his entire motivating force. The War of the Austrian Secession was not about economics, like people say, or trying to get more power. This was a one man showing his father that a gay guy could be as good a king as anybody else. And I think, and, and, and from that comes this home, because they, they have suppressed this, because my German translator, when she read the book, she said, I, I never thought about it. We never were told that Frederick was gay. So, you know, from that, where that was suppressed, because of Frederick's actions, that's what Kaiser Wilhelm will, will emulate in World War I, and what Hitler will emulate in World War II. And I suspect that if they had known what Frederick was really like, maybe they you know, maybe they might not have or but whatever, but they, that's, um, that's something that you really have to think about. That was because that's not what they teach you in school. They're not what they're going to tell you in school. This is but that was what that war and that war bleeds into the seven years war, which is us. That's our war, French and Indian war. And that's just a continuation of a woman shouldn't be allowed to rule and a gay guy shouldn't be allowed to be king. That's all. That's it. It's, it's I think it's fascinating. It really is. Um, and I think it's great that we can write about it and read about it. Um, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't been, the gay revolution has been is so recent. I mean, you know, you go back and look at, um, oh, you know, the, the computer guy in England, you know, I can right. see, see Derek yeah, Jacobi not. biting into the apple, but you know, I mean, it was 1956 or something and he was basically hounded to death for being gay. And it was just still, imagine what would happen if we let people be who they are. If we just let people be who they are. talking about Turing? Well, yeah, I'm talking about Turing, but I could go back and talk about Oscar Wilde if you want to, because yeah. there's yeah. another example of, you know, somebody who was hounded to death, basically, um, because he was gay and because he wouldn't back down from it. Right. You know, it was the father of the boy he was, or the young man that he was having sex with that um, pursued him with such a vengeance, um, Devonshire, Duke of Devonshire, actually. Um, and, you know, Oscar Wilde ended up paying the price for it. So there we go. Anyway, it's been wonderful to talk to you. So Patrick, thanks for your time. I'll let us remind you, we actually sold out, but we have reordered this marvelous book, um, In the Shadow of the Empress. And I'm telling you, if you read it, you will learn a great many things that you were not probably never thought of. I certainly did. And I thought I knew a lot about all this. So, <laughs> so what's, what's next for you, Nancy? Have you picked your next topic? 
Not yet. I'm still I'm still getting off. This was four years of and you can see how much research went into it because you had to go from different and there was a lot of translation. I'm a very slow translator. So I'm kind of gearing up again to, <laughs> to look. But I'm sure I'll go into the next century. I'm dying to find out how everything played out into the next century. So, so you're coming into the 19th century yeah. for whatever it is you write. Yeah. I love the progression. I think that's wonderful. Right. If you live long enough, you can write about the 20th century. <laughs> right. Yay. I'm, I'm done. 20th century has been covered. <laughs> right. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. It was a great. Day. Thank you for having me. It was really a pleasure. Good night, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.